Okay. Hi, I'm Gabe Hollenby. Uh, my title isn't senior developer anymore. Uh, it has been in the past. Now I work here at AWS as a technical evangelist. It's an interesting title. All it means is I'm a software developer who also likes talking with people, <laughs> speaking at conferences, <laughs> writing blog posts, um, uh, organizing and attending meetups, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, it's a really awesome job. You know, AWS built a lot of cool stuff. My job is to stay on top of all of it uh, and educate developers about what they can build on AWS and inspire them to build cool new things. So if any of you have any questions about that, we can talk. But you know, tonight I'm not even here in a work capacity. I'm here in a personal capacity to answer any of your questions about my career as a senior developer or at, you know, what it's been in the past. Uh, I've been writing code for over 15 years now. Uh, a lot of web stuff, but a lot of back-end stuff too. Uh, I've done a lot in the educational technology space, real-time online tutoring. Uh, I worked at Pivotal Labs and Neo uh, doing agile software development with Mike at the time. That was really great. So a lot of test-driven development, uh, extreme programming, that sort of stuff, uh, agile dev. Uh, and then before coming to AWS, I worked uh, at a company called Spire, which was here in Singapore and built nano satellites. So it's like satellites are about this big, and we would design and, and manufacture them in Glasgow, launch them on, on many rocket launches around the world, and collect data from space, bring them down, uh, and do a lot of interesting data parsing as well. So happy to talk about anything from my past. And I guess there's interesting questions going on behind us. This might be for laughing. Enough about me. Okay. Hi, I'm Shiling. I'm CEO of UIlicious, and basically we are a developer tool to automate user interface testing for web application. As for myself, I started uh, coding at when I was nine, mostly because I wanted to create a new pets application uh, on the page for my pet and I wanted to figure out how to make my scroll bar sparkle like all the other ones. <laughs> then afterwards, I went to uh, in junior college, I studied uh, computer science and I think it's a horribly stupid idea to <coughs> teach junior developers C++ at the start. It's horrible. <laughs> Pointless is stupid, <laughs> my opinion. <laughs> and anyway, uh, afterwards, I, I went to SMU, uh, Singapore Management University, to study information system learn how to configure SAP for a living, did not do that. <laughs> I decided to become a web developer in a startup and that's my life until now being a CEO of uh, Dev2. Okay, um, hi everyone, I'm Ginny. Um, so, I was just thinking about you know, how, how to introduce myself and then it so happened that a few days ago, I got the notifica notification on LinkedIn. So I went to look went into LinkedIn and looked at my profile again and I, re and I realized that if you read my um, job titles from my current job to my last few jobs in reverse, it looks like a career progression. <laughs> <laughs> it got longer? Um, it got more powerful. <laughs> so, so, basically, well, I've been doing development since uh, a long time since I was a kid. Um, pretty much I think around the same age as <laughs> you did when you started as well. <laughs> um, and then when I was in school, I decided to um, intern and it was doing, I was doing um, something that I'm quite embarrassed to admit these days, um, basic, visual basic <laughs> specifically, not .NET, it didn't exist yet. <laughs> um, so the other languages that I did when I was uh, interning as well don't really um, register in, in people's minds anymore, like Perl. Um, yeah. <laughs> and eventually I got into um, doing Mac OS and then from Mac OS, I, uh, it, it, iOS happened and then after that I started a company doing iOS consulting and I was doing that for a very long time so I was so-called CEO of the company and then I was invited to join a, another startup uh, then I became CTO and then that startup got bought over by Carousel so I became engineering manager <laughs> and then I left and joined SP Digital which I'm now in title Principal Software Engineer uh, what that actually means, I'm not so sure. <laughs> uh, except that I write code and I manage a genius. <laughs> yeah, that's so that's me. Alright, so great uh, round of introduction and give everyone a chance to upvote 
many, many questions. And the first one, <laughs> tabs versus spaces. What, you, what is your answer? <laughs> Whatever the repo was using when I came to it. <laughs> <laughs> so Please just, just use ESLint, it will magically indent everything. You still got to configure it though. You can use standard. Okay, fine. <laughs> Which is two spaces. Space. Oh. Space. <laughs> <laughs> a space. Bye, guys. Answered. And the next one. What advice can you give for someone who is self-taught in coding and looking for a developer job? Where do we start? I don't know. <laughs> you want to start? Yes, start with Okay. Um, so, I, although I actually came from a CS background, uh, I had the CS degree, but um, I was also freelancing. Before freelancing was a sexy thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this was before I even went to college. So it was a bit hard, um, as you know, like for a 16, 17 year old kid to basically tell, convince people that they should pay me money to build websites for them. Uh, so I guess <coughs> one thing I had going for me was at least um, there was a portfolio, there was things that I put up online that I could show people and yeah, that got me. That got me a foot in. So I'm not sure if this answers the question. Mm, really, got portfolio. Yeah. And that yeah. So I think if you, if you don't really have like a lot of like strong credentials or experience, if you have something to show people and say that hey, you know, I built this. Mm, mm. Yeah. It's, I think it's a bit more relatable. Okay. Yeah. Well, these days, uh, I when I became a CEO, I finally uh, started interviewing developers and trying to figure out like uh, who do I want to hire. I got a lot of resumes. So I do see that there's a difference between people who came in from the university background and people who came in uh, self-taught is that uh, those profiles that really stand out is when they show me a project they have done in, in school. But you like that kind of opportunity if you are self-taught. If So the best way to do this is to build a portfolio of uh, projects that you can show and not something uh, very simple and shallow, but something complex enough that you can explain to me how a problem actually, uh, how do you solve one of the more complicated problems in the application. And also, generally, uh, a more interesting project that is different from what you've done in school or what you've done at GA will also help. Yeah, and my answer is pretty much along the lines of what you've already heard. Uh, personal projects or you know projects that were involved in your studies it doesn't matter show code that you wrote that you can have a discussion about uh, I think it also helps if you're willing to talk about uh, the messy parts about it too right um, I think a lot of times when we interview we always want to put our best face forward and that's understandable uh, but a question I like to ask is you know, what what are you like least comfortable talking about in, in this in this code base that you that you're showing me, right? What's not good about it? Let's not talk about just all the awesome things you did, but what what did you do that's not great or that you would change if you had had time? Uh, the, the really interesting discussions come from that. That'll give me an insight into the level of maturity uh, that you might have as a developer, uh, or you know your your comfort level to be able to criticize your own code, which I think is a, a good quality to have. I realized when, uh, when I was hiring people, I also tr tried to find out what they do in their free time. So I kind of asked them, what do you do in your free time? What, what projects, what are the side projects you're working on? That also gives me an indication of like how, 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 in, how passionate they are about you know, writing code and being, being in this industry. Right? Yeah. Can I just add on to that though? As a recent father, uh, I have a daughter who's eight months old now. Uh, I'm now, I used to be in the camp uh, very strongly you got to have side projects, you know, outside of work that you can do because that's the that is the indicator for passion, right? It is an indicator for passion for sure, but I think there are plenty of people that have a lot of obligations outside of work and can't get time to do more code, you know, when they leave the office. And that's totally fine too. Uh, so I don't think you have to have side projects, but if you do, it helps. There's, uh, there's something like having uh, portfolios and putting stuff on GitHub, but what about for people who have a lot of 
who work on a lot of private projects, right? As in client projects and whatnot. So a lot of bulk of their of their contributions are actually in private repos. Yeah, yeah. I I had a problem when I was uh, changing jobs as well. So basically, I just thought of the most complicated part of the application that I did. It was very uh, deep. And I just explained an abstract concept it's like, hey, I optimized the reports in the application and I did this and this and this and this and this and, this and the problem was this and this. So if you could explain like how you solve a problem uh, abstractly in a very deep way, it helps. Uh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I've also interviewed quite a number of candidates who don't actually have portfolios or anything public that they can show. So what I usually do is when I have conversations with these candidates, I try to ask them to tell me, explain to me, you know, I'll just, um, whether or not I know how that system generally works, I'll just tell them, explain like I don't know. And then from there, I'll just like try to dig deeper and deeper and deeper and to see how, you know, how well does somebody actually understand something. If they can explain to me very concisely, very comfortably, I think comfortable is the key word here, then you know that, you know, this person has um, technical depth, has enough uh, appreciation of the the, the systems and the things that um, he or she develops with or works with and sometimes you may not necessarily be the most knowledgeable developer in the room but if you show the um, ability to actually really try to understand the things that you're working with that's already a, to me a positive sign mm. that's cool all right so let's go on to the next, next question what do you wish you knew as a junior dev <laughs> Honestly, uh, I think I wish I wanted to know a lot of things uh, everywhere, a little bit of everything. But I think because I'm a web developer, and one of the frequent things that, that um, keep recurring <coughs> was that the whole company, we did not have automated tests and we didn't know how to do it. <laughs> and we keep arguing over what tests to do. So I kind of wish, like, why didn't anyone teach us in school, like, how do you write good quality code instead of just making applications, yeah. Writing hmm. tests. <laughs> um, I think for me, one of the turning points where I had some of my own self-reflection and thought, I'm becoming not a junior developer anymore. Oh, I've, I've, I'm noticing this change in myself. It was when I became more comfortable <coughs> reading source code that other people wrote and not just at the application level, right? I think a lot of times, you, know, you and I might work on a, on a repository together, some project, we're building something, and whatever the thing is we're building, the odds are we're using some sort of open source code for something, right? Some library, some framework, maybe multiple packages, doesn't matter, right? We're, we're leaning on other code uh, that other people wrote. And there will be times where we have questions about it, where we need to figure out how to do something. And I used to just read the documentation, and that's a really great first step, but the best documentation, sort of, is the code because it's the only thing that won't lie to you once you get comfortable reading it. And so, my like the one thing I wish I had told myself to start doing sooner uh, was, don't be afraid to just go look at the source code for that you know that plugin that you're using or that library, whatever it is. If you have a question about how it's working, or if you wonder, you know, what other, what other arguments can I pass to this function, or what is it giving back to me when I call it? Go look at the code, just give it a shot, and you won't always understand everything you look at right away. But I guarantee you, if you don't start doing it, you're not gonna get any better at it. So you should just start and you'll get better with time. Yeah, I learned a lot of stuff from opening the source codes of all the <laughs> third party libraries that I put in, uh, I, I use in my projects. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I don't really know how to answer this question because I'm still asking this question myself <laughs> these days, today. And I, I think the, the, the thing to keep in mind is that um, even if you're a um, senior developer in terms of years of experience, in terms of you know, having a bit more um, in-depth knowledge in a particular area, you will always <coughs> find yourself um, in a situation where you're learning something new that somebody else knows better, maybe even a junior developer, but you just don't happen to know it yet and you try solving it on your own and then somebody comes to you and say like hey you know why don't do this and you go like oh i wish i knew this earlier i wish someone had told me this earlier so 
It never ends, so I think yeah. you shouldn't feel too bad about feeling like you don't know or you wish you knew something. Sure. So in line with that, how about this question? <coughs> in your experience, what, what are some glaring weaknesses that self-taught developers have? What can they do about it? Well, I worked with a pretty good self-taught developer when I was uh, still working as an engineer by one of my older companies. And the thing that I found out that was a glaring weakness is that uh, is knowing database design. So there's a lot of things that they teach you in school that you don't really get to explore and learn in your own if you're learning on your own time. So one of these things is um, it, one. It, it's quite easy to write SQL queries, but how do you design a database that is uh, in some situation where you need to have fast read performance or fa fast write performance and it's a whole theory on its own that mm -hmm. I think it's a really important thing to learn if you want to build any kind of application. But that's one of the um, areas of gaps that uh, I found out. Database design? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Gabe? So, I'm going to editorialize for a second. I don't like the term self-taught developers. I don't think many of us are self-taught. I mean, by the definition though, I think we mostly say self-taught. I'm self-taught too. My degree's in English and creative writing. Uh, I've just always been interested in programming computers and pursued it a lot on my own. But it's never on our own, right? We're community taught. There's a bajillion blog posts and YouTube videos and meetups like this. Nobody's self-taught anymore. So uh, remember that too, right? If you're feeling like you're just learning on your own, you, you, you never have to do that journey alone. Of course, you all know that that's why you're here. So maybe this is uh, you know, preaching to the choir. But uh, one area, I guess, would be uh, testing. Uh, how, to, how to think about testing how to not be dogmatic about it, uh, which is hard because when you're first learning something, what you want is rules. You want, you want somebody else to tell you what to do and how to think about a, you know, an approach to programming and a problem. Uh, but the answer to everything always is it depends. And that's true for testing too. And so figuring out the nuances beyond you know, what, what do we feel comfortable with testing in which ways? What can we get away with? What's going to be the right payoff in terms of investing time and learning how to test this new thing? Uh, what's likely to break? What's not like, likely to break based on what code we're going to touch? These kinds of things, uh, I think, uh, would be valuable for, for junior devs to, to develop more of an opinion on. And, and again, that just comes from practice and from lots of struggle and, and, and figuring these things out by writing lots of terrible tests and lots of projects over and over and over again. And you don't realize they're terrible when you're writing them. You only realize later, you know, sometimes years later where you're, you're doing something else and you go, oh yeah, this is better. I just learned this. Why was I testing this other thing that way before? That's silly. So it just, it really just, just come from time and practice. Um. I guess for me, it will be in terms of like uh, the way you write your code and how it will, how your code will scale when it's uh, run over like say for example large data sets or you know run over um, a lot of iterations. So, oh okay, all right, sorry. So um, I guess. M Probably one area where I've, I find that sometimes uh, self-taught developers, I wouldn't really necessarily say uh, have a glaring weakness, but maybe it, maybe have a slightly less strong foundation in, would actually be in terms of how you write your code to make sure that it can still perform well and not run too slow or run out of memory or crash when it needs to run over a large you know, data set or um, it needs to run over like many iterations, like for example, you know, if somebody, the easy way to write a code and get it working on a, on a small data set could be like, you know, when you have nested loops, um, try running it over like a few thousand rows of data, um, rows in your database and it kind of just breaks down. So, uh, but you know, there are actually tools out there and resources for you to actually learn up on all these things on how to make sure that your code can scale. Can I add one more? <coughs> Read the damn air message. <laughs> Actually, I agree. You know, I think that we can ask the question in inverse as, as well. Like, what should some um, people who go through formal education, what should they unlearn? Actually, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I actually agree with you. I find that a lot of uh, the 
school taught uh, developers when they first come in they want to do things the perfect way it has to be <laughs> perfectly optimized and fit every everything perfectly and I thought god damn it you spent two weeks on these projects I wanted it out last week <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could have gotten things out if you did things, uh, break down the problem into a small little iteration and slowly build it from a good solution to a better solution, then maybe someday the perfect solution, eventually. Yeah, there's huge value in code that runs today. Yeah. Huge value in code that runs today versus tomorrow or next week, even if it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. Optimization go is good, but premature optimization is bad. That's cool. So let's mark that as answered. And the next question in the list is kind of really in relation to this um, about learning. How do you balance learning a lot about everything or deep dive into a topic? So how do you know you're learning something that, can, that will be useful to you and maximizes your time spent? It's a bit of a mouthful here. <laughs> well, this is all balance. Right? How do you balance between what what the new, newest, coolest framework to jump into, or like figuring out what you know to get good at? Uh, okay, so for me, I feel that um, when you're working on um, something or particular technologies, let's say for example, you're a web developer, you will almost never ever work with just that immediate language or framework that you're working with. So, say for example, you're doing React with JS. Right, you learn React, you learn JavaScript, but you also probably be working with other things like, for example, you need to learn CSS. You will need if you are working in a, um, if you are doing TDD, you will need to learn about testing. So frameworks like Jest, uh, Mocha, or, you know, whatever else from the Gajillion frameworks. I noticed there was a question about that as well. <laughs> um, and then if you are working in a continuous environment, integration environment, CI, CD, you need to learn things like you know what your the Jenkins or you know the Circle CI or Travis CI or whatever CI tool you're using, you need to learn that as well. And then you'll be writing some scripts to automate some of your build process. And then you need to learn that scripting language as well. You know, could be say Python, Ruby, Bash scripting. Um, and then you need to do deployments. And how do you deploy? Maybe you need to deploy with Docker, and then you'll be learning Docker. So there's actually a lot of auxiliary things that you will need to learn in order for you to actually get your work done. So I think one way you can start is actually by you know picking up all of these auxiliary things and sometimes those things can actually lead to you learning other languages. For example, if you use uh, this tool called Danger, which is very fun, it's Ruby, and you pick up Ruby and then if you do enough Ruby and maybe one day you might end up just doing Ruby on Rails because they needed uh, somebody who knows Ruby and you knew Ruby. Honestly, I think for me, I'm just generally curious about things, especially if they just pop up uh, according to what's adjacent to what I'm currently working on. So, but for me, I try to follow where my passion or current passion lies in. At some point, it was in data analytics, so I studied a lot of D3 and a lot of uh, various analytics techniques. But now my focus is more on like, hey, how do I make really great, awesome, high-performance UI right now? Yeah, so I think, I think it's good, but I think generally it's good to try to broaden your knowledge and be a good, uh, decent enough generalist. And then I think it's better uh, to progress into specializing into one branch that you really like. Yeah, yeah I'm going to agree. I think that uh, I recommend being a bit of a generalist at first, uh, but what you said about like picking up something on the periphery or adjacent to whatever you're working on, I think that really resonates with me too. Because you know, Jenny enumerated a lot of things that you need to know in order to get stuff done. Need is like a really squishy term here, right? Because like, I don't need CI uh, to, to write some code and get it deployed. Uh, I don't need Docker. I don't need to write tests. Uh, these are all things that you know probably are going to play a role in your software development life someday, but it doesn't need to be from day one or day 50 or day 500. Um, but what I think you should do is start with one thing that's related to whatever it is you want to, to learn how to do. And again, that's because you're picking a project, right? You're making a project that's somehow interesting to you and you're going to let that drive 
your, your decisions for what technologies are you going to use for that. Now, there's going to be a lot of options, right? I want to build whatever, this thing. I'm going to use this language or that language, this framework, that framework. Doesn't matter. Pick one that you have friends that can support you in because that's the most important thing. Uh, because you're going to get stuck at 2 in the morning and you're going to want to have friends that you can ask <laughs> then or the next day. And, and you know, it's, it's so much easier to ask a friend than to figure out how to write a well-crafted question on Stack Overflow and hope that it's going to get answered. <laughs> so you, really, you, you pick something that your friends know, learn that, and then pick something on the periphery uh, to, related to that and learn that too. I don't think you should be learning more, th more than one thing at a time. Uh, so, because you, then you're just learning all the time and you're not getting anything done. And you're probably just doing it kind of badly across like a really, you know, thin but very wide spread. So, don't do that either. Uh, choose your learning budgets carefully and, and, uh, and deliberately. Yeah. I want to agree with, uh, on the part about getting somebody to work on code with you. It's like pair programming and finding somebody who already knows that piece of technology. Right, so finding somebody who, or who knows Docker, somebody who knows about you know, test-driven development in JavaScript. So just get them to just show you the ropes, right? Show you the few things. I remember we're back in New York, uh, and we were like working on a Python project. I had, uh, it was a Django project, I had no knowledge in Python. So I, I just sat with uh, one of my colleague, James, and he was like really, really, he's really good at this. And he showed me like, oh, this is how you do a function, this is how you do da 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 da. So in no time, uh, almost a week later, I was writing my own module in, in, in Python, right? Just because we need to. <laughs> so, um, yeah, finding a good partner or friend or somebody you can pair with, I think that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. right. right, so next <coughs> up, we have, it's just, we're getting into the career and scaling up into the senior developer kind of questions. So how different are the responsibility of a senior developer versus a junior one? And what is the career tra trajectory like? Uh, well, I think the responsibilities of a senior developer involves more in communication, being able to clearly communicate um, ideas to your team members. So that's one kind of thing. And another thing about uh, what I expect from a senior developer is to be able to balance uh, the requirements, uh, as in not the, not the individual requirements like your password must be right but more like the requirements of security the how fast the time needs to how fast this project needs to be completed as well as usability so balancing all of these things is really really difficult and um, I think a software developer a senior developer should be able to figure out like what's the best compromise to and uh, to get the project moving forward in a reason to a reasonable standard uh, career trajectory is quite varied. You could uh, go into project management path, you could specialize into one technical path, you could just be a, a very um, zai generalist that does solution architect and maybe CTO someday. Yeah. I would like to actually um, say that, so a lot of people have this um, thinking that, you know, the typical trajectory is like you were a um, junior developer and then you become a senior developer and then you become a slightly more senior developer and then you become like say an engineering manager or you like you know go into more management but that's not necessarily always true um, and um, the thing the thing about going into engineering management is kind of like a parallel track so at some point, um, at some point of seniority, then you actually diverge into two branches. So one part will actually go more into like you know people management, and that's the engineering management track. And but you can still be a very very senior technical lead. You know, go into like principal um, software engineer roles, architect roles, and that's like really you know remaining very rooted in the technical track. So it's not. Like, you know, if you don't become a manager, that means you, your career has stagnated. It's actually two parallel tra tracks altogether. I agree with everything that you've heard about career trajectory and, and the relationship between seniors and juniors. Uh, something that uh, we didn't say yet that I think is also important to John is uh, code review. So uh, th if you have a team and there's a senior dev on the team and 
a junior dev, the senior dev should be reviewing the code of the junior dev yeah. and suggesting ways to improve it. That's an art in of itself, right? Like there's, there's huge books and blog posts and podcasts written about how to do code reviews well and not well. Um, and just because you're senior doesn't mean you know how to do it well at all. Uh, it's, it has to be learned. But I think a good senior dev is also capable of staying on top of the, the repository, right? seeing all the, the changes that are happening, uh, and, and taking responsibility for the mentorship uh, and growth of the rest of the team <coughs> and, uh, and themselves. Yeah, and I think one more thing about um, being a senior developer also is that uh, one of the values of the senior developer is actually not so much in the their technical knowledge, because sometimes you can be a senior developer um, in a role in technologies that are completely new to you, so you wouldn't really actually be a so-called senior or the most knowledgeable person for the technology, but your value is actually in the experience that you bring to the table, basically your battle scars, you know, the knowledge that, oh, you know, if we, do, if we were to do this thing, we'll need to handle cases such as X, Y, and Z, otherwise, you know, things will crash and burn. And I think that's where the value of the senior developer really lies, which is basically experience. And that is something that you can only gain by literally, you know, staying you know, staying as a developer and growing as a developer and eventually with years of experience you get there. So in, in line with the question about uh, responsibilities, I also want to bring this up. What are skills that are required to be a senior developer? So I already mentioned uh, previously uh, one of the critical skills for being a senior developer is being able to communicate. So this is like in line with code reviews. So you have to be able to clearly, concise, uh, concisely uh, explain what, uh, how the code can be better and not give like fluffy, vague answers and just leave them alone to deal with it. And yeah, so, so that's really, communication is really, really important. And uh, being able to prioritize a task because you, as a senior developer, you just get all the, a lot of huge tasks here and there. And some, some of them are urgent. Sometimes you just get like, hey, I got an urgent bug request. Or hey, this client said they want this feature. But then, of course, uh, sometimes yeah, you need to balance out and figure out like, okay, which one is higher priority? Which one you want to float up and down? Yeah. I think related to that is uh, figuring out when to, when to leave the crappy but working code alone. <laughs> <laughs> because I think most code starts out crappy, right? And then we have to make a choice. Do we make this code better or do we move on to the next thing? And you know, and then you know, sometimes you move down to three next things and then you know enough about how your system is evolving that you, it necessitates going back and cleaning up a little bit of the crappiness and the things that came before. But sometimes it's the right call is to say, you know, we need to get this thing done. Uh, we all agree this is bad but it's working and it, if we all agree that we're unlikely to touch it right now and that in the, the, the requirements about that we're gonna put this code through are not going to change in the near future, then uh, the best use of our time is probably to leave that alone and work on the rest of the things we need to get done. Uh, and, and again, that just these kinds of gut you know, calls of, ah, this feels good enough. It's, it, it's an instinct a lot of the time. You can't justify it. And then that's the hardest thing. That's the, to, Again, as juniors, right, you all start out, I want my checklist. This will tell me, that the rules will tell me when I'm done with this and I can move on to the next thing. Uh, and it's not like that. A lot of it just comes from experience. And, you know, you used the term battle scar, uh, Jenny. Uh, I often think about building software as kind of like navigating through the wilderness. It's a similar metaphor, right? Like, you, I might never have been in the desert before, but if I know how to, you know, survive and navigate through the jungle and you drop me off in the desert, a lot of those skills translate. Mm -hmm. And so... We're constant, to be a software developer is to constantly find yourself surrounded by the new. If you're not working on something new, it's probably worthless because somebody already did it. Why are you doing it? So that's, we are always at the frontier of our own abilities and of you know, the, whatever it, we're developing. And you just have to pick up the skills for navigating at the frontier and, and surviving and not getting lost. Uh, for me, I would say um, empathy, actually. So um, the ability to actually empathize with a variety of things um, from a 
let, if you are building a product, you need to basically be able to empathize with the um, user, you know, that you're building that product for, that you're building that feature for. As someone doing a code review, you need to be able to empathize with the other person and the constraints that they may be writing that code under. It could be that, you know, that imperfect code that they just submitted in the pull request could be because they needed to get something done quickly and they had a tight deadline, you know, and this was the best that they could do in the deadline and it works. Um, it could be that they had technical constraints that they couldn't use certain technologies, therefore certain options were not available to them and therefore they had to go with the second best option. And I think sometimes as senior developers also, we are sometimes a bit too quick to judge uh, when we see things that are not perfect, but I agree with um, Gabe actually that good enough is actually better than perfect. Um, sometimes if perfect is not working or not going to be delivered soon, but good enough is, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then good enough is essentially good enough. Yeah, yeah I have this recent experience with uh, writing, you know, how many of you guys use Code Climate? Code Climate? No? Okay, anyway, it's a code scanning tool. Basically, it tells you how good your code is, how bad your code is, based on, you know, some standards out there. So, that there's a Ruby, the, 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 the part that scans your Ruby code will tell me this part has too many lines. <laughs> this function has too many lines. So I was like, I'm still refactoring. Come on. So, yes. Yeah. Um, learning how, how to let it go and yeah. mark as won't fix uh, for now. Yeah. <laughs> I actually had a recent experience also. So, I was working with a junior developer mm -hmm. on some linting warnings. And the junior developer was telling me that, oh, you know, I don't want to do this thing because there's so many warnings and I don't have time to fix them now. And I was like, that's fine. You don't have to fix them all at once. You don't have to clear all your warnings. Sure, sure. You know, you don't have to keep, you know, um, <coughs> making sure that every build is, you know, completely clean. Yeah. You know, especially if you have a deadline to, to sure. work towards to finish your feature. Leave that uh, warnings in. Make a note of it. Mm -hmm. Prioritize which one should be fixed first, or which one you don't want to fix. And just leave it there, you know. Because if you don't do it, then you never, you never know if you know there's areas of improvement in your code base. Whereas these linting tools already tell you where mm -hmm. areas um, are there uh, to improve, and that actually is a very good learning tool as well. Can so I add on to that before? Sure. You want? Um, extending the sort of wilderness exploration metaphor a bit more. Uh, we have this thing, sometimes we call it the campsite rule, right? leave the code base cleaner than you found it. <laughs> and to, you know, to your point about linting, you don't have to fix all of them. Fix one, yeah. fix two, yeah. done, right? Spend five minutes making it better than it was when you found it. I think that's a characteristic that's a, you know, very clear. You can, you, this is a rule that you can live by. It's, you know, I, I've been giving a lot of squishy advice, but I feel like there are some <laughs> things I can say that are just definitely good advice that you can follow every day. This is one of them. If you feel like you're leaving the code cleaner than you found it, that's one step closer mm -hmm. towards being a, a more senior developer. Yeah. So in line with the question about senior developers, maybe I'd like to answer this roughly. <coughs> Kind of <laughs> <laughs> Slightly controversial, but let's get into it. You know, sure. What is uh, a bad developer? Bad senior developer. Okay. So, most dichotomies are false. Having said that, I will say there. I feel that there are often two kinds of software developers. Okay. There are the ones who, all the time, are <coughs> feeling like they don't know what they're doing, uh, and you know, are asking for help, and just feel like. The, you know they're a little bit lost, and there and that's that's me. But then there are the ones that feel like they always know what they're doing, and they need you to feel wrong and stupid because that's what makes them feel right. And they love to argue and they love to tell you what's wrong about everything that you're doing, right? Unfortunately, being good at programming computers doesn't involve being good at talking to people all the time. And so there is a subset of humans who have fallen into our career who are great at talking to computers, like unarguably great at it, but not so great at talking to people. Uh, and I think bad software senior developers are, are those kinds of people. I used to be one of those kinds of people. 
I used to want to show you how smart I was all the ways I could. And I wasn't smart looking back on it, right? But I thought I was. I thought I knew everything. And, you know, I just slowly over time with more practice and, and more exposure to a lot of people who were much better than me, I came to see myself in a much more accurate light, which is, no, there's, yeah, I know less every day because my, my, I zoom out a little bit more every day and see how much more there is to, to know about that I don't know. Uh, and so I think being, uh, being someone who, who can comfortably say, I don't know, and, and, and help me understand is a characteristic of a good, uh, you know, more experienced developer, and the bad ones say, I do know you're wrong, and this is the end of the discussion. Pretty much agree with that, and I generally think that there isn't really a bad sort of senior devs per se, but just really bad teammates because you write code with other people unless you are working, you are a rock star, and you are building this product alone. And bye bye. <laughs> yeah, so just it's just really, just really bad. Uh, I only work with uh, senior developers who are just bad, very bad team players. So, yeah, yeah, um, arrogance. Yeah, arrogance and not being a team player. So I think similar to what has been mentioned already, um, I would any day, at any day, hire somebody who is technically not as good as another candidate, but they are a much better communicator, much better team player, less arrogant. And um, I have passed over really, really technically strong candidates that are just really arrogant, you know, and they like to, sh and I felt that they w wouldn't get along well because even during interviews, you know, their personalities were already coming up and they were challenging you and making even the interview feel very. Um, some some people can even make yourself make make you question yourself, <laughs> um, and that's not really the kind of. Um, environment that I would like to have in my engineering team because like you know like um, Shilling said it's a programming is actually a team thing you know you write code with other people so you need to be able to get along with other people and if you have this one very strong developer but you know starts um, pointing faults at everybody starts um, telling people how they should do their work you know even though it's none of his business or none of her business then I'm sorry um, you're just not the kind of senior developer that I want to work with. Okay. So back to more positive light. <laughs> Let's back to this. Is that a difference in your learning process from when you were starting out as a developer versus the you now with more experience? What learning strategies do you feel is productive or effective? Definitely. And I think I can give a concrete example. When I was first starting out, I think my primary way of, of learning was um, going through books uh, that you know would kind of explain projects and frameworks uh, and libraries all the way through in the context of sample projects, for example, um, or blog posts, right? That say, "Here, I'm going to walk you through how to build blah blah blah." Whereas these days, the, my learning process will often involve something new falling on my radar for whatever reason, a new library, a, a language, whatever. And one of the first things I'll do is I will sit down and at least skim as much of the documentation as I can. And my goal is not read it all, commit it all to memory, I'm perfect, I can recall everything. No, not at all. That did, that's impossible for me. Maybe some people have that gift. I'm not one of them. But what's useful about that as an approach that I found in my career is you give yourself the opportunity to remember something in the future if you just gave, if you just expose yourself to it at the beginning, right? So if I know I'm going to be spending some time using some, some library, I'll go and I'll skim through the documentation, and then, you know, later on, my brain might go, didn't I read this in the docs? Maybe, and some of the time I'm right, and I did, and so there I just saved myself like 30 minutes of, of wondering if it was even possible or what the right way to do it was. Sometimes I'm wrong, and I go, I spend 10 minutes, 20 minutes looking through the docs, going, no, I know I read it here, and then I can't find it, but overall, net positive in terms of in time investment at the beginning versus, you know, by the end of the project. I think uh, learning is, for me, uh, quite depends on your learning style. So for me, I'm more of uh, maybe a kinetic kind of learner where I learn everything by doing. And initially, most of the ways that I learn how to do things, even if I'm given a book, I will just read the title and I'll flip the example and ah, I understand this, magical. 
And usually if I uh, and, and then I will start trying to build a small little thing with it. So for web application, all the different kinds of frameworks, then I'll just do the standard to do MVC and see if I like that framework. If I do like that framework, I'll go read the documentation on what's great, what people are saying that is great about this uh, new framework. But I think it's generally the same. If I'm learning Docker, I'll kind of look at some of the examples of how people write a Docker setup script and then say, hey, this looks like something that's easy for me to pick up and teach to other people. Yeah. Really? Um, for me, I think, um, so there, there was a time where when I picked up something new, like for example, when I was learning Rails for the first time, um, I just looked up a blog post and I I think there was a really, there's this like famous um, tutorial about learning Rails where you build a blog clone and they teach you how to create a author model and then you have to like this um, blog post and then you have like a blog entry um, some, something like that I can't remember I think it's there's, there's a whole website dedicated to it and there's a tendency to basically just follow the steps and do it and you, and like oh every step you follow you copy paste the code and oh it works you know you write write it up type it out wholesale again like oh it works and at the end of the day you have successfully built this blog app clone and learn exactly zero <laughs> because it just works, right? You just copy and paste and everything works. So um, I think um, one of the things that I started doing a little bit differently these days is when I learn something, I would actually separately document and maintain my own set of, you know, like learning documents kind of thing. And um, sometimes I'll just like try to mix it up a little bit, change it up a little bit, and I think it's um, also nice that you know we have a lot of code that's easily shared these days like github um, so I like to also learn uh, through reading other people's code you know um, taking notes about what I felt I learned so that you know when I go back to do something again I don't have to like oh how do I do that you know how do I scaffold a rails app again let me go back to that tutorial and start from scratch everything again I just open my notes like ah this is why I should do this is why I should do that so it's kind of just at least for me a way of forcing myself to really understand what I'm learning rather than copy paste oh it works okay move on to the next thing yeah I think it's pretty important to learn the principles mm -hmm. behind all the examples that you will see because like if you can you can see there are so many uh, blog post application that there's so many ways you can build this application but why did the author choose that way of writing his code to build the application that it's more important to understand the principle behind it you can see a lot of this in Stack Overflow answers where the people give the, the example of how to solve this solution but they also give you a nice explanation on why this solution yeah. is better as well. Just on the topic of learning before we move on, there's something I have a strong opinion about and this seems like a good time to, to, <coughs> to share it. A characteristic that I think helps separate junior from more senior devs is how well you know your editor. I don't care what editor you use, I really don't. But I do care that you know it well. Uh, learn the keyboard shortcuts. Not all of them, because there's probably more than you can ever learn. But learn the ones that you're doing all the time. And this is a catch-22 in a way, like, OK, Gabe, well, how do I know which ones I'm supposed to be learning? How do I even know that there's a keyboard shortcut for that thing that, that I'm doing all the time? If you don't know, then you can't start using it, and your, your life's not going to be better. Just start noticing the, what you're doing in your editor a lot with the mouse, and I can almost guarantee you there's a way to do it more efficiently. And those things really add up and keep you in the flow. So just whatever editor you're using, just learn it. Like that is time well spent. I have a, I have a story. <laughs> True story. So when we were pairing, uh -oh. back in Neil, um, so back in Neil, uh, we would use Vim. So a bunch of us use Vim. And we use, uh, right, uh, we're, building, we're building a Ruby app in, uh, in Vim, and we're using Tmux. And I was pairing with Gabe, and he was like really, feeling really frustrated because a keyboard shortcut that he knew would work, usually works, doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> he was, out, for me, I was like really new to the company. I was, like, I was afraid to ask him like, oh gosh, uh, uh, could we just move on? Oh, I really want to say move on, but I just didn't dare to say it. But he was like, he persisted, he persisted. So what I learned from, he persisted, I managed to fix the problem and got that shortcut working. 
and it was basically to run the test in a different TMAX window. Mm -hmm. Remember that shortcut? Yeah. So uh, you couldn't get it to work, you figured out what was wrong, and it was working. So once that you got it working, uh, getting f feedback from our tests was much faster, and you will be able to go through that, uh, that, that story really, really fast. So the proficiency, from that experience, I, I realized proficiency in your, in your tools is important. Proficiency in your tools that you use is important in getting, uh, getting really good at what you do, right? And I think one more thing I want to add is don't be afraid to ask the simple question or like <coughs> once a seemingly dumb question. Mm. You know, because sometimes a lot of people take for granted that you know, this is you're supposed to know this and then you feel embarrassed if you don't know it and then you're afraid to ask. Um, I can guarantee you that I have interviewed a lot of candidates where I asked them a very simple question and I've lost count of how many times I've actually stumped people <coughs> because everyone thought that it was a simple question that you're supposed to kind of know it but because I don't really know that thing very well I don't necessarily know all the technology so I was oh, actually what is this? and they're like, um, yeah, good question mm -hmm. I don't know, <laughs> you know and if you're afraid to ask your colleague, then there's always, you know, Mr. Google, you know, you can always ask Google. And if you're afraid to ask Google because you're afraid later, if you're Googling something with your colleague and then they see that like, it comes up in your history, there's always private browsing on Google, <laughs> right? <laughs> so there's really no excuse for you not to ask a question. Also, we forget things all the time, even us senior devs, right? Like, let's just level set for a minute. So it's like, yes. you know, we're... Just today, and I've been programming in JavaScript for like over a decade. Just today, I, had to, I Googled, how do I remove an element from an array at a particular index? Because I didn't remember that it was array.splice. I, yes. I looked that up today. Yeah, I always forget that. I can't, can't tell the difference between slice and splice sometimes. Yeah, yeah, so, so like don't think that you have to remember everything. Like that's, you're not a senior dev when you have to look these things up. We look the stuff, we, I Google like a hundred times a day, stupid stuff just like that. I'm yeah. embarrassed to see all the tabs in my browser. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nope, not the answer, not the answer, not the answer, not the answer. Ah, I found it. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah I lost count how many times I Googled regex rules. <laughs> regex rules. Regex101.com is still <laughs> like the, the greatest site for interactively evaluating regexes as you're writing them. That's cool. All right, so let's come up to some somewhat personal or directed questions. This is Dr. Ajini. What is it like being a female developer in a male-dominated environment? What can the industry do better? <coughs> <laughs> well, you know, I guess both of you can answer <laughs> if you wish. Uh, so, interestingly, I was also having this conversation earlier today with another colleague. Um, and I, it's, it's not something that is just, that is necessarily directed to women only, but I think there's also a, there's a male-female divide, and then there's also a junior-senior divide. Mm. Because I think a lot of the problems that a lot of uh, women encounter, I think in general, if you, if you were to just like probe into the issue a little bit, I think, um, to an extent, um, any junior developer, regardless of whether you are male or female, will also encounter it. So, um, <coughs> one one example could be would be you know when I'm uh, okay. Let me let me rephrase that. Um, I think sometimes people kind of like assume that. Um, if you're a female developer, especially if you go to meetups, like quite often I lost count how many times I go to a meetup and somebody just asks me, oh, you're a designer, are you marketing? Are you <laughs> accompanying your husband? Um, and sometimes I also, I myself also end up feeling intimidated or I don't really want to go to certain meetups because I really don't want to deal with these kind of questions. So that feeling of intimidation, I think is quite similar um, quite similar in the sense, you know, some, sometimes, you know, you go, you go to a meetup and you have all these senior developers or people who are really experienced talking about things and you feel like really intimidated and you don't feel very welcome if, regardless of whether you're a female developer or you are a junior developer, sometimes you might feel it as well. Um, I think 
what can be done, I think the fact that you know this junior death exists also is actually a very good thing. Um, and I think there's a lot of uh, meetup events like uh, tech ladies and so on that tries to uh, encourage and create a safe space for women to actually um, get together, learn, talk together. But I think the industry as a whole also needs to understand that it really shouldn't matter whether you're male or female. What should matter more is actually your ability and your ability and your tenacity to learn something. Yeah. I was remembering a quite funny conversation I had recently. Um, uh, there, there is a lot of uh, events lately that are targeted at like gathering females uh, to talk about technical stuff and it's a female exclusive event and so it does get a bit tiring sometimes when you have these kind of events where instead of talking about technical issues they are talking about feminist issues and I remember uh, one of the conversations I had with another lady is like man I wish everyone just stopped pushing feminist issues on the table and instead let's push gay, gay issues <laughs> <laughs> My <laughs> jokes aside, I, was, I do think that uh, uh, in my experience as a professional, I have not really ex uh, experienced too much uh, sexist comments or gender-based discrimination. But I did feel that uh, sometimes in in uh, when I was uh, in schooling, probably more because everyone is more immature, um, that. If uh, when I'm inside a male all male group, sometimes they behave like frat boys and they talk about um, very graphic things, and sometimes they talk about uh, they talk about uh, they just talk about very male interests like soccer and video games. I, I like video games, but <laughs> but I, I think it's quite important. Like um, uh, I don't know whether in some companies they, are, they do bring this frat culture on board. That's where the programmer <coughs> thing feel comes from. And I think it's important when uh, for, for anyone, whether you're in an all-girl group or an all-guy group, not just to uh, to try to include the other party and they, uh, they, like uh, get them uh, talk about their interests as well. Like if I'm in an all-girl group, I also I also get very bored of listening to people talk about Korean dramas all the time. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's very important to try to get to know everyone in your team. Yeah, is important for bonding as well and uh, better. <coughs> I think um, having th this, you know, community or communities around you, and you know, identifying who can be people who can so-called so sponsor you. Not sponsor in terms of monetary sponsor, but um, sponsor <coughs> your learning, help you along. You know, introduce you to. Uh, other communities that are equally supportive uh, that actually helps and I think uh, just keep in mind also that um, there will always be people who will be a pain in the ass <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say that word on video it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> Yeah, so you know, it's it's there's always going to be people like that, but on the flip side, there's also a lot of people <coughs> who are ready to basically um, support you, help you along, um, provide a good environment, a safe environment for you. And you know, if you are in a company where you feel that you're not very well supported, um, you know, <coughs> if going if leaving the company is not an option for you, then you could try finding outside um, help, you know, mentorship <coughs> or um, have somebody outside that you know, can help you along and give you guidance on how to navigate um, all these issues. Okay. Yeah. So uh, there's a question for Shiling as well, so mm -hmm. I'll just go quickly to that. What made you want to make uh, to start your own company, and what are some advice you give someone who wants to open his own, oh. or their own? Well, for me personally, what I always wanted to do as a kid, and what always drive me, was to create value in the world. And I think uh, I was previously working at a ad tech company, and I thought 
like creating technology for people to serve ads is horrendously stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, I was also getting really, really bored of uh, what I was uh, doing in my day-to-day -day programming, which was basically uh, CRUD. It's just create, read, update, delete databases, forms, reprints and repeat for different entities or uh, new concepts. And I got really, really bored of that. And I wanted to work on something new and interesting. And um, founder story is more uh, just like I, I decided to join Entrepreneur First and met my co-founder uh, Eugene. And we just both talk about how frustrating he's over there. But we just talk about how frustrating it was to <coughs> to test. Uh, web application because the story is that back then when I was working in one of my previous company we didn't have uh, DevOps processes. DevOps processes is more of a modern thing in the recent years and back then uh, what happens is when all the users are asleep the software engineers are awake and we will be ready at 2 a.m. to get the green signal from the manager to press the button to that says deploy. Uh, of course, it's not just a button. It's actually a few steps. I run the <laughs> command line to and do this, run this script and that script. Yeah, but anyway, to get the gold sig green signal, and because our team, we had a team in Vietnam who did um, testing manually, and it was really hard to uh, as we build more features on the application. In there's two problems. One is that the team cannot keep up with the testing lo workload. And you cannot simply just throw more human beings at the, the problem of testing because there's a communication overhead. You know, you need to communicate to more people about how the application is supposed to work and make sure that everyone has a consistent understanding and you can't just keep adding more people on the team. So I kind of figured, mm. hey, um, we need to make a way, make, create a way for people to be able to, we need to automate our tests <laughs> so that we don't keep doing the same shit over again. It's boring. <laughs> I um, when I suggested to my testers who one um, one programmer say, uh, could you guys try some of these tools for automating testing for the UI? And then they basically say, are you crazy? Are you asking me to learn HTML, CSS, JavaScript, uh, Selenium, this uh, goes inspector, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You may as well just send me back to university <laughs> because there's a lot of things to learn. They were like, okay, I, I think we need to we need to create a tool to automate testing, something that is easier for people to learn, uh, and uh, one integrated platform. But anyway, that's uh, my my original motivation for creating my own company was that I wanted to create something of value and something that is uh, excites me as well as uh, is techno technically complex for me and exciting for me to to build. So, um, what advice would I give to someone who wants <coughs> to open his own com company? Uh, I think the most important, there's two very important advice I would give is one, you must um, validate that there is someone who is willing and able to pay for the product because you need to survive on money at the end of the day, you need to feed yourself. So you need to first and foremost make sure that someone is willing to buy me. It's not your mother. It's someone. <laughs> and, it's, and, and not your mother, not your friend, not your best friend, but some stranger that you think is a potential customer. Go, go ask them if they want to buy a product, and then, uh, then build the product. Don't don't build it first. Uh, maybe maybe you can build a prototype first, but don't don't wait forever to build your your idea, and then find out that nobody wants it. So that that will be a waste of time. The other thing that I would advise is building your own company is really, really difficult and community support from co -found, uh, other founders uh, from entrepreneurs so that you know that everyone is in the same shit as you really helps because it motivates you because everyone, there's someone else um, going through the grass, thick grasses with you. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. And let's do a quick one with Gabe which I think you probably can answer very well. Mm. Oh, you're tossing cap over there. Only you, two minutes. <laughs> yeah, I have thoughts. You don't want to pair on the answer, Mike? <laughs> 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 like old times. Sure. Um, so, uh, pair programming, it's a thing. Uh, if you don't know what it is, it's two, t traditionally two people, two keyboards, two mice, one computer, right? One editor. Um, 
uh, can be more than two people too. They have mob programming where it's a whole room. I've done some of that. It's also it's a really, mob. It's what? yeah, it's a real thing. It's actually yeah. pretty interesting too. What are my thoughts? Um, it's really hard to do well. It's not something that just intrinsically happens when you take two people who know how to program computers and sit them down next to each other and say, work on this together, you're pairing. Uh, you need to learn how to pair well. And uh, the way I learned how to pair well was you know, working at uh, Pivotal Labs or Neo uh, and with other people who already knew how to pair well and they taught me. So I think the best way is to, to learn from somebody who, who already feels like they're, they're decent at it. Um, there's probably other ways too, but it's just that my, my journey was through you know, direct exposure to people who already knew how to do it well. I think it's great. When done well, it's extremely valuable. Um, what I, I used to tell people that when I pair, I have this laser focus that I didn't even know it was possible for me to have. There's like, you're, you know, you're coding, you're in the zone by yourself, sure, that happens. But when you're pairing, you... There's this natural ebb and flow that happens when you're, when you're wor at least when I'm working, when I'm programming, where my brain switches levels of engagement. I'm, I, I, have, I know what I want to do. I do it. And then I have to sit back and I have to think about what am I doing next or why is this not working? Because my brain was in like solutionizing mode and then I'm like, oh crap, there's an error. And now I have to switch gears a little bit because my brain was already ready to do the next step because I assumed that what I just wrote would work, but it didn't, and so now I've got to put that on pause, shift gears, why is it broken? <laughs> when you have a pair, this, you, you fall into sync, and whenever you kind of pause and go like, oh, I'm not really sure what to do next, your pair is almost always ready to go, Yeah, I got it. Yeah, so I can, I can walk away, take a phone call, come back, he's still in context, he still knows the code. I can get right back into it just as easily, so yeah. this is good. Yeah, yeah. so it, when done well, it's an amazing experience. Uh, some people who don't like it say, well, you, you know, I'm, I'm wasting time. I'm having two programmers work on one feature at a time. Okay, yeah, but the code review is happening while the code's being written. So you don't have to do that later. You know it's getting reviewed because you're convincing your pair that this is good enough to move on. You're writing much better tests because you've got two heads thinking about all the surface areas of what could go wrong, uh, what's worth testing, what's not worth testing, is it whatever, all that stuff. So in general, it's great, but... Um, I also think it's it's not for everyone, and it's it, you don't necessarily need to do it all the time. I don't think it's worth being religious about, uh, but it's a, it's a great tool to have, uh, and I encourage you to try it sometime if you haven't yet. All right, thanks, Gabe. So we got that answered. Let's click that. Ah, uh, decisions, decisions. Uh, let's try. Let's go with this one. Some let's end on a positive note. What are some skills and traits to have? to be a great programmer? Tenacity, okay. right? I tell a lot of people uh, who are getting started with programming and who just like don't know anything about programming, <laughs> every day I oscillate between feeling super smart and super stupid, right? Many times a day, it's back and forth. Oh yeah, You have to get comfortable with those highs and those lows uh, and just realize that that's, right? you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. That's, that's programming every day. And so having the tenacity, sometimes I describe it as like you're just smashing your face into a wall until you manage to knock that wall down. And then there's another wall. It might be one foot behind, it might be 20 feet behind, but you're going to get to another one. You're going to smash your face against that wall until that wall falls down. And that's, that's the progress that you make. And, and some days just feel awesome, and some days feel like you beat your face against the wall all day. But uh, if you just stick with it, you get shit done. There's, there's my answer. The one of the best traits to have for a programmer is being uh, knowing how to debug your code on your own. I am I get quite surprised many times when I work with the junior developers and they told me, Shing, I got an error, I don't know how to fix it. Then they say, Okay, what do you do last? Last. They say I, I did this and this and this and this last. Uh, uh, I did this. Okay, undo that. Then what is it still broken? Yeah, it's still broken. Then I do your last step. <laughs> Just go Controls, step by step. Control C. Control C. <laughs> step by step. Figure how, how, where, and where, how you broke your code first. Uh, you, you, you can speed through it by adding things like breakpoints, uh, learning how to use. Another thing that goes back to know how to use your tools, know how to use your editor. Your editor, a lot of editor comes with very great tools such as the debugger. Uh, yeah, so you should learn how to use your debugger and figure out like how and read the stack traces and how to evaluate um, 
uh, variables live and to figure out. And it's a great place to catch all those weird, strange race constellations <laughs> that only happen in certain scenarios as well by stepping through the bugs. Yeah. Yeah. I, I take it one step above, uh, one step up some more. Um, sometimes when develop junior developers come to me and say like, hey, you know, I've got this problem, I don't know how to fix it. Um, I don't know how to use the debugger, and then I'm like, okay, have you tried printing it out first? <laughs> we try to printf console.log, and then they're like, they try, they try to do it, and they're like, ah, there you are, there you have your problem. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I think we still got one time for one last question, and then I hope we sort of bring the highest one here so far. Let's see. Let's go with this one. So because of course we all so a lot of you here are junior developers. Is 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 understood that juniors take longer to code at the beginning. Is that true? I think it's a fair generalization. Uh, I mean, if everything else you know aside, I think if you take somebody who's been programming for five years, or somebody who's been programming for for five months, and you say, "I hear here's your task. Uh, you know, just write me a simple thing where." I can type a username in at the command line, and it will find me the last 20 tweets from that person. Uh, you know that 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 mention other people. Simple program, right? We could write that. It probably wouldn't take too long. Uh, I think that the the senior dev is going to finish it faster than the junior dev. Sure. So I think that in general, that's a fair statement. I think a mark of a senior developer also is recognizing that a junior developer will probably take a bit more time, and allowing that junior developer a bit more time. Oh as well. yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, I think um, me and Eugene, we kind of agree that junior developers require six months to train at least to get through like every single um, layer of our stack from back end to front end to CSS to JavaScript because the stack is thick and there's a lot of things to learn and I don't think, I don't really think that you can learn everything by sitting in the office eight hours a day for three months and staring at the same lay of the stack, you kind of need to slice it and in investigate each of this. Then you will learn how to code really fast. Yeah. But it's not a disadvantage mm. or a problem, it's just the natural cause of things. I think, personally, I, I think you also have to resist the urge to jump in and just write code immediately. But because sometimes, uh, senior developers also think are slow, are slow at writing code. Because we spend more time reading code than writing code. And planning. Right? And planning for like, oh, how should I design this piece of code and all that stuff. So don't ever be urged like, let's write some code, let's write some code. No, 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 let's take a step back, right? Let's look, take a look at this, what's going on here. Right, so. One last thing about that, this reminds me. Uh, I think it was one of our colleagues, Rahul, who was talking about a, an experience that, that he had where the converse can also be true. He was saying, uh, he w we hired him as a junior developer, and he was saying uh, at Neo, he had this experience where he was working with a more senior engineer who, he was said, wow, there are so many times where we have a question, how does this thing work? And this senior person, they just said, let's find out. And you just, you write like three <laughs> lines of code and just see, see what happens. So there are times where the, the right thing to do to, is don't, if you can answer yourself by just writing code for a minute, just write the code for a minute. Make a little right. Start a new file. Write your like five lines of code. Run. Question answered. Yeah. That that is a characteristic of, of I think more senior engineers. That sometimes they're willing to go. Yeah. Let me. I don't know. But we can figure that out very quickly. Let's do it. So yeah. sometimes we're quick to write code. Sometimes we think a little bit more. Again, it depends. Yeah. So I, I use IRB. You guys, Ruby Ruby is here. I just use IRB to kind of figure out how does this syntax work, right? Mm. And I'm too lazy to read the documentation. <laughs> it takes too long. It takes too long to load the page. I just go right in. How does this work? All right. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Or I would even like uh, use tests to guide me along. I use tests to like, okay, I think this piece of code should work this way. Let's write some tests to verify that, and then write the code. If it doesn't, <laughs> there is something's wrong, <laughs> right? So, yeah, that's cool. Um, I think that's all we have. Any f any final words from you guys? Uh, <coughs> I, I, I just suddenly remembered uh, one of the I was reading on dev.to. That's a great resource, and I remember uh, it is it's just it's really funny when they ask a lot of developers like, "What is the greatest thing you enjoy about coding?" And <laughs> for senior developers, is deleting code. <laughs> 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 it's not writing anymore. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Judy? Um, you know, for all that we have talked today about, you know, being a senior developer, how to become a senior developer, you know, what should you learn, how should you learn? I think sometimes we also um, glamorize senior developers a little bit too much because I find personally, because a lot of my work these days is actually um, mentoring and coaching um, younger developers as well. And sometimes I feel like I actually end up learning more from the junior developer in the course of teaching because sometimes sometimes it's just a matter sometimes it just it's just a matter of you know a fresh set of eyes challenging a, a fresh set of opinions or thoughts challenging what you've already known so far you know hey, this has always worked why change things and then somebody comes up and says like what if you try this wouldn't that be better and you're like yeah it could be let's try it out and it turns out that they are right so be proud to be a junior developer and when you do become a senior developer don't um, don't <coughs> look down on the junior developers because they will also have a lot to teach you then. Okay. there's no such thing as a senior developer <laughs> <laughs> I have two parting words. This is one of them. There's no such thing as a senior dev. I think we can all agree there's, there's a state where you're a junior dev, and then there's a state where you feel like you're no longer junior. And then it's just relative, right? Then like Ginny was saying, it depends on the context. Sometimes you're going to be you no know, more than the person next to you, sometimes you're not. So you, at some point you will, you'll feel comfortable saying, I don't feel like a junior dev anymore, but that's, that's really it. The other thing that we didn't talk about, but I think it's worth a quick two sentences or so, Imposter syndrome, that's something we talk a lot about in the industry. Uh, for those of you who don't know, it's, I, I, maybe I'm gonna mischaracterize it, but I'll try and get it right. It's that sense that like, you know, you're, you're succeeding uh, because like everybody's fooled and you're, you, you feel like you really don't know anything about what you're doing, you're not worth it. Like, uh, why, how did I get this job? I suck. Uh, they just, they haven't figured out that I'm an imposter yet. And a lot of advice that, that junior developers hear is, yeah, that's imposter syndrome talking, don't worry about it. I also want to say that it's not necessarily true that it's always imposter syndrome. At the beginning of your careers as software developers, it is fair that a lot of the time you actually don't know what you're doing. And you should embrace that. Don't dismiss yourself going, oh, I, you think, oh, I don't know what I'm doing. No, 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 I do know what I'm doing. That's just, that's just imposter syndrome. Uh, I remember reading about that. Sometimes that you don't know what you're doing. And so the, the real way to move forward is, is to just always be getting out of your comfort zone and checking in with other people, right? Yeah. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? Here's what I think. So don't work in isolation. Try and work with people who you feel are better than you and that you can learn from. And eventually you'll have a day where you say, I don't feel like I'm a junior dev anymore. Yeah. And don't always assume that a senior developer necessarily knows more or better than you. Yeah. yeah. We don't. Yeah. Most of the time, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> but great. Anyway, thanks Gabe, Shilling, and Ginny for a very insightful uh, q and I hope you guys learned a lot in this whole, this whole uh, hour plus. Sorry it's a bit long, so thank you for staying so late. Uh, before we go on, there's one last thing. Uh, this is something I've been trying to work out and create. Uh, this is something that I, I talked to Gordon who runs a program at ThoughtWorks called ThoughtWorks Jumpstart where they actually like, you know, uh, bring uh, people through a 12 week program so what I he has approached me and said, hey, we, we should try and collaborate and do something together. Mm -hmm. So one thing we'll, we'll be talking about is uh, this thing that we're trying to do, like more hands-on sessions. Because from the last few surveys I have conduct, that we have conducted, I see a lot of you wanted to do more hands-on sessions, mentoring, you really want some people to teach you things like pair programming and stuff like that. So this is something we're going to try. Uh, the first one will be on the 30th of June. You'll be at TalkWorks on a Saturday. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll create a, an event on our meetup page soon. But essentially what we hope to do is come together and do some coding together, learn some co uh, There'll be some talk workers there who will be sharing with us uh, their, te their techniques and ways of doing this. Um, oh, Gordon, you're still here. <laughs> I didn't realize, sorry. So uh, yeah, um, so Gordon, you want to share a bit more about that? 
Yeah, uh, so before I talk about my idea, maybe I would like to do some quick surveys uh, just to find out uh, who will be interested. Uh, so, uh, by the way, I'm Gordon. I'm working for a company called uh, ThoughtWorks. And uh, so let's do a, a few quick surveys. One survey is, so how many of you feel that uh, you can still improve your coding skills? <laughs> That's good. Oh, I see a few people who didn't raise your hands. <laughs> but, uh, okay, then the next question is, how many of you feel that you can commit three hours every two weeks to improve your coding skills? Hmm. Okay, still a lot of people. Depends That's on good. two weeks. <laughs> and, okay, um, one more question. Um, how many of you have heard of the terms like uh, coding kata, coding dojo, uh, code retreat? Okay, still, uh, many people. I'm very happy I'm in the right place. Uh, <laughs> so uh, so the, the idea I was having is to probably conduct some uh, hands-on coding sessions uh, every two weeks uh, on Saturday afternoons, probably three hours, and uh, where we will primarily uh, just practicing our coding skills um, in the format of uh, uh, coding kata, uh, coding dojo, or coding retreat. Uh, the target is probably uh, practicing the problem solving skills, uh, maybe some pair, pro pair programming skills, and also the, uh, the TDD uh, or refactoring skills. Uh, so through those uh, exercises, uh, you will become a better developer. Uh, we will start from this, and uh, we will continuously getting feedback from uh, the uh, attendees and to see how we can improve it, or what content, or for what format we need to change. And uh, also, if for those who didn't raise your hands, uh, feel free to join us because uh, you're <laughs> awesome developers, and uh, you can be there as teachers or instructors <laughs> for us. Okay, that's it. Uh, yeah. So we will, as uh, um, Michael said, we will put the, 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 the venue and the timing and the details on the website, Meetup web website. Uh, you can sign up uh, to attend the events. Are you guys excited about that? Come yeah. on. Yeah? yeah? Cool, right? Woo. Awesome. Thanks, Gordon. Cool, thanks. Thank you. So once again, um, <laughs> so yeah, that's, uh, that's the end You're, uh, of today's Meetup.